Okay, so you should be able to see my my screen. So as as I say, um, I tell you what, I'm not going I'm not going to show it in presentation format so that I can see whether or not somebody has a chat for me. Okay, so the chat room is is now quiet, which is good. So if if another chat arises, then I know it's basically a question for me. So so that's fine. Okay, so uh, my name is Donald McEnany. Um, I teach in PCU. Uh, and uh, I've been working in the area of mental health since about 1983. Uh, and and over, the, over the years, I've been involved in a survey, as some of you may remember, of two, 2,000 uh, workers who were out sick for various reasons, and 40% of them had a mental health issue as it transpired. These were in five countries. We asked them what worked, what didn't work. And so that was working with mental ill health rather than mental health. And during that process, we realized that actually, you know, mental health has a very bad press because what you need to do is you need to take a kind of a healthy view. It's called salutogenic. And I apologize for the, for the big word, which means that you need to look at mental health in its own right as something that's of value rather than seeing the absence of mental health our absence of mental illness as being mentally well, which which it clearly is not. And so we ended up doing two large um, health pro mental health promotion projects uh, for the workplace. One of them, which was basically developing a, a set of tools and a, um, a resource of 400 different uh, health promotion uh, tools that, that at the time. Now that's, I have to, as I will say later on, a lot of this stuff happened before COVID, obviously, and also before the workplace became fragmented by COVID. So, but nevertheless, it is possible to kind of take some of this stuff and move it forward into this new millennium. Um, I mean, it did happen in, in 2006, 2007, but still it, it, it saw that mental health was happening in a workplace and people were actually going to a workplace and actually meeting each other in corridors and that managers were actually having face-to-face -face meetings with people. That, that, that was just an assumption we made at the time and that's not an awful lot we could, you know, we couldn't foresee what was going on in the future. And then we did another one, which is a training course for mental health promotion for staff. So those, those are all available links to those websites. They all, uh, exist now as websites. Now they are EU websites, but nevertheless, uh, they uh, th there is some useful information. And there's a textbook that arose from the TMHP project, which is workplace health promotion. There's another textbook for uh, older people's um, residences, and there's another one for schools if you're interested. Okay, so. Um, this uh, is about what do you what do you talk about when you want to talk to workplace stakeholders, and I, I think that just between ourselves, this is what we need. This is not the way you would phrase your message to stakeholders, obviously. But this, these are the two things we need people to get to get an understanding of. And the first one is that mental health happens at the nexus between a person the workplace, the person's personal life, and the person's characteristics in terms of their experience, their beliefs, their misconceptions, uh, the strategies they are bringing to it. And mental health um, ca can occur for two people in completely different ways. So it's this thing where I just, and I'll just give you an example of that, right? So, uh, I graduated out of McGill. I went back to Ireland. I got a job. I was girded to the loins in rehabilitative voc rehab. I was girded to the loins with new ideas. I was brought into an organization, a big voc rehab organization with a view to modernizing and moving things forward. The one thing that organizations absolutely despise is innovators, hero innovators. So as soon as I arrived in, I was working, I was this guy with these academic ideas, the existing management, my colleagues were very antagonistic towards me. My su supervisor was very, um, uh, zero feedback. It wasn't negative, just zero feedback. Head office was only using a vertical communication process. Uh, I had a small team. 
the team was made up of new people who were enthusiastic and burnt out people who had been there for a long time. There was a lot of team conflict. I did have resources in terms of I was able to bring in two uh, social psychiatrists as one day for half a day each for to consult. Uh, but ultimately, I was three years in this particular space. And the battleground was people. It was the people in the centre that were that were being used as a human shield by the conservative uh, aspects of the organisation. And it, it resulted in me experiencing a significant amount of, uh, I would call it, if, if you remember all those uh, stress models, I, I would say it was the transactional, really. I mean, the actual work wasn't that hard, but it was the transactional aspect. It was the interfacing with other people that was really, really difficult. Now, as a person, I was youngish, you know, I was in my 30, I was 35, 36. I was highly enthusiastic. Uh, I used uh, alcohol a lot for recreational purposes, but not basically as a, as, as a medication. Uh, I smoked, um, I, I, but I did exercise. I went to the gym and I did long walks, etc. But the one thing that saved me, well, two things saved me in, in that job. And one of them was my experience in McGill had been even worse than what I was experiencing in, in, in my first job as in voc rehab. And as a result, I had developed a, a major thick skin when it came to negative feedback. And on top of that, uh, the second thing was I discovered a strategy called the myth of the hero innovator, as it turns out, which was how to create organizational change. And without those two things happening, I, and then I got promoted out of it within three years. I don't think I could have lasted much longer than that. Now, but that's a basically a mental health scenario out of my own life. But that's an example of how my genetics, my personality, my learning, my health, my behaviors, my workplace, and the people in my workplace all come together to create a situation that could be really quite a toxic, uh, if you want to put it that way. And there were some members of my team who just didn't survive. They had to leave. So that's, that's kind of, we need to get that across, is that, look, we're not looking at one thing or two things. We're not just looking at the workplace. We're looking at the nexus between the person, the work, the personal life. And if this thing, these things are not at least compensating for each other, if not in balance, then the person is either going to uh, become disabled through mental health difficulties or will continue to be engaged in productive work. And so it's, and just a little rider on that, which I think is important as a message, is that just because somebody does not go sick does not mean that they aren't costing the organization a significant amount of money. Because there are, because mental health is a, uh, is a hidden disability, you, what happens is that people continue to turn up. When we interviewed those 200, 2,000 people, many of them had been pre-contemplating going um, out absent from work on the grounds of mental ill health for over 12 months. So in other words, they hadn't been performing at work for over 12 months and had had no help and, uh, and at the same time were we're not performing. And presenteeism is something that I will deal with later on. It's a very important topic for your discussion with, with uh, stakeholders. The second thing is that um, we kind of think about mental ill health a lot when we're talking about mental health. And obviously, even for me, when I was thinking disability management, a lot of what I was thinking about in the early days was, well, how do I get somebody back to work? So I had made this kind of leap of assumption without even realizing it, that, that most of the work that a disability manager would do when it came to mental health would be helping people who had a diagnosis of mental disorder to get back to work. And over the years, it, it became increasingly clearer to me that actually, look, as soon, if somebody goes out, out of work, if somebody goes absent from work, they have lost the fight in the sense that while they are still at work, they may not have a diagnosis. 
It may be that there's workplace factors interfering with it. It could be an environmental problem. But as soon as they go to their GP or their doctor or whatever, and they get their diagnosis of mental disorder, they are now mentally ill. And this lets everybody off the hook. And they can say, ah, well, you know, Donald, that's the way. He was always a bit like that. I knew he would be a bit like that. And so when you're getting somebody back to work, you have all of these stigma issues to deal with. You have all of this uh kind of the person how do you explain to co-workers you get all of these complexities if you can get in before any of that happens and keep the person productive at work then you, you divert them from needing to if you like resort to absence as as a strategy to deal with their distress uh, but you also are creating a, a healthier more positive um ethos in the organization and in the team so I really like La Montagne, and uh, I don't know if it's a she or a he now, um, but La Montagne has been basically proposing this approach, which is called uh, an integrated mental health approach. So it has to be an integrated approach, and that is integrating psychological health of all workers and managers, protecting that in order to reduce the likelihood that somebody is going to become mentally unwell as a result of a workplace factor, but also promoting mental health by training up your managers to be responsive and building the resilience of the workers. And without those three elements, the likelihood of a successful mental health program uh, is reduced significantly. And that is the second message. So the first message is, look, you've got to look at a lot of different factors that are happening for a person that are inter intervening in their in their life as they experience health and mental health and you have to see the workplace as having three levels of intervention that need to take place and luckily for canada uh the um you know the the the, the uh CSA has actually produced, the Canadian Standards Association has produced a standard against which you can work. Now, I'm quite happy to answer any questions about that standard because I know it got a little bit of bad press. The good news is that, as you will see later on, you don't have to put the standard in place in order to gain a return on your investment in, in, in mental health. So, so those are the kind of the two big messages now, there are more slides here, maybe, than I need for an hour. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through to a certain point, and then I'm going to ask for questions, and then I'm going to move on. But you will have access to this uh, PowerPoint afterwards. So who are we talking to when we talk about stakeholders? Well, clearly, if you have, an or if you have in your organization an Occupational Health and Safety Committee or a Disability Management Committee, they would be the most important place to start. The senior leaders of the organization, you probably won't get to them first. So you need to kind of move up the organization to them. It is absolutely essential that you get human resources listening to you, to what you're saying. Um, the, with the CSA standard for psychological health and safety, the occupational health and safety profession has become a significant ally in terms of creating a positive ethos within an, I, I call it a mental health promoting organization. That's what you're looking for, really. And if you can get the organ, in fact, the organization in this case is the client, uh, in, in certainly in terms of moving it towards a, a more open and empathetic uh, ethos for, for people who are experiencing mental distress. Supervisors and Middle managers are very important as well. And then union representatives and shop stewards are really important. And a lovely paper by Corbier uh, and colleagues. What they did is they did a scoping review of the, um, uh, the, the literature and asked questions. What can we find out? And it, this is quite a recent paper, and it's, it's well worthwhile having a look at. What... Um, do we know from the literature about the role that stakeholders can play in return to work? But they were specifically looking at uh, common mental health disorders, which is great, uh, which kind of suits us very well. 
Uh, and so I, I'm at the end of this, if we have time, I'll discuss some of the messages that they, some of the roles that they would say that the workplace stakeholders play. The actual paper itself is much broader than that. It deals with workers' compensation, disability insurers, uh, health providers, uh, so and, and you can get and you, and each one is dealt with in in a very systematic way. I, I think it's a lovely article and and well worthwhile. But I have been using that as if you like my focus for who the audience is in this in in this webinar. So let's start. Uh, how would you start a conversation in this day and age with a stakeholder? Well, I don't think there's any doubt that you probably have a pretty good start if, if, if you talk about COVID. Because COVID is up there as one of the major uh, changes, if you like, in, in, uh, in relation to mental, the mental health of the workforce. Uh, and in particular, the fact that it has fragmented traditional views of what uh, the workplace actually is. So there's no doubt that there are benefits to remote working. I mean, if you're a good remote worker, I mean, the evidence shows that if somebody chooses to go and work remotely, they can have much higher satisfaction than people who are working on site and they're more productive and they're not, they're not, they're absent less often and they, and they don't have to commute. So they say they're less stressed, but if you're somebody who hasn't chosen and if you don't feel supported, then working remotely and this is what happened with covid uh, uh, is that people didn't really have the choice it was just the government said stay home so there's increased isolation the balance between work and life comes through very strongly in the uh, in in the research that's been done because luckily a lot of uh, organizations have been kind of monitoring what's going on and then this other one which you know is critical and very hard to resolve, but dis disrupted communication flow. I mean, if, if most of the time you're with your family, you're kind of have your door barricaded and you're only getting to talk to your manager once a week, that's a very, very difficult position to be in. If you don't understand something, you can't just kind of take someone aside you know, in the corridor. What is the equivalent on the internet of a corridor? Uh, I, I would imagine something like a WhatsApp group is like a corridor, but uh, but you don't have that kind of same facility. So in order to kind of look at what actually uh, COVID did to people, and uh, I think this is kind of useful information. Now, obviously, if you're a skeptic, you'd say, ah, well, this was done on US workers and US workers are different to Canadian workers. And I agree that they are, but ultimately you can't argue with 1200 voices. Uh, that's a very, very strong sample. And this survey basically asked people, what was it like, you know, what, was, what, what impact did, did mental health, did, did, it, did COVID have on your mental health? So 80% of the people reported that they had issues relating to mental health issues relating to COVID. And 65% felt that it had impacted their ability to work. 40% reported feeling close to burnout. 25% were describing severe impacts on their work. And only 14% had actually accessed professional help, and most of those had paid for it themselves. So I think that's an important message if you're talking to the HR department in the union. You know, hey guys, you know, what would your results be like if we went out and did a survey of, of your, and, and how many of them would say that you communicated with them effectively? How many would say that you help them access appropriate professional help? Going further, 50% of the workers were optimistic that things would get better. But 47%, this is the other side, said basically no supportive communication from their employer for over three months. 40% believed their employer didn't care about mental health except in, in, in so far as it impacted on their productivity. 35% were considering changing career uh, and 25% reported that they, they were of the view that their employer did not support them. Um, 
I actually did a survey of, of CSPNM members, and some of you may actually remember that. You may even have actually um, participated in it. But one of the things I'd say is that the there was a fair amount of synergy between the you know the results of the workers and the opinions of of, uh, of DM professionals. Now this was done fairly early on in the in the pandemic. Uh, so things may have changed now, and I'd really love to do a follow-up to see what it would be like. But definitely mental health concerns had increased. Claims had increased uh, in, relation to, uh, in relation to mental health and COVID. And this was increasing the work demands of the disability manager. It was much more difficult to sit down and establish rapport uh, with with somebody virtually who was out sick and experiencing distress, uh, and the, over sixty six percent of respondents said that stress and anxiety in the workplace uh, were very relevant uh, to to dealing with uh, with co with the impact of COVID. There were two kinds of stress. There was the stress I I described. Uh, which was a problem, but there was another stress, which was frontline workers having to go in to areas where they might be infected, where the risk was very high, and how that was impacting on them as well. So the biggest challenge for disability managers was providing support to the workers whose, whose mental health was at risk um, and to their families, uh, and at the same time, work, when, they, when the disability manager themselves was working from home. Uh, and most, there was many people who said, look, it's not that I have a problem working from home, but my organization wasn't ready for us. They moved us out, and but somebody has to go in and access the files because we can't get at them, et cetera. So there's a lot of other issues there. And there were some pretty distressed DM professionals who answered that as well. So, yeah, so I would reckon th that's an interesting way to get started. Okay, there's two chats here. Um, so, oh, Teams, right. So basically, Samantha is saying that Teams is an interesting corridor. Uh, group texts. I, the only thing is, I, I hear what you're saying, but in my view, the corridor is somewhere where your boss can't hear you and there's no record of the conversation having taken place. Uh, so, so, so I, I would never bring something up in Teams that 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 had that connotation. I think probably WhatsApp is probably not a good place either for it. But um, uh, so you know, I mean, I think you can. Actually, well, we will actually come to this question later on. Hopefully, I'll get to it. Uh, how do we use ICT to create uh, mental health promoting work conditions? Uh, but those are two interesting suggestions. Very good. Um, so, uh, I, I'm basically, um, do we see this? Uh, so this is the economic case for workplace health strategies. Obviously, having got your in, having kind of done the COVID thing to try and get into what the stakeholders are finding important, making it really relevant, then you have to be able to throw out a few serious kind of bombs that basically give a sense of where where we're at in terms of mental health. So the cost of mental ill health to the economy, according to the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development in 2011, they estimated on a global scale in OECD countries is between three and four percent of GDP, which if you translate it into Canadian terms is about, is between 46.58 and 62.11 billion every year to the economy. Uh, it's, as it turns out, Chapman then in, in 2019 came up with the 5 billion. Uh, and uh, he, he, they basically attributed about 6 billion to lost productivity, taking into account absenteeism and presenteeism. So the rest of it would have been taken up with disability payments and health and treating, et cetera. But the other frightening, um, well, I think it's startling, is half a million Canadians are unable to work due to poor mental health in any week. 
Now, I think that that's a message that kind of, if that gets across, I have another chat coming up here. Okay, we're getting onto a sidebar here on Teams. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I'm quite happy, Chilean, if you give me a, um, a, a tutorial on Teams at another stage. Let, let's leave this Teams debate until we get to the ICT uh, section of the, of the, of the presentation. Um, so that's the first thing, right? And then there's the positive thing which is that employers who were viewed as managing mental health well were over two and a half times, performed over two and a half times better in uh, on, on the stock market than those who were perceived as doing it less well. And their staff turnover uh, was four times higher for less performing companies. Now that's a while back, but nevertheless, it is quite uh, stunning that better productivity and better profitability is associated with two and a half times better performance on the uh, on the stock market and the other thing is that i i, mean, I think we have to say this is that mental health related presenteeism costs three times as much as absenteeism and it's actually increasing more rapidly than absenteeism so, so it's not enough when you're looking at the impact of um, of, of mental health on an operation to, to you bet, where do you go and get the data? Think about it, right? Where do you go to get the data? You can go to the absentee data. You can look at the diagnosis. That is not the mental health related cost. That is the mental ill health related cost. Uh, it is nothing to do with the mental health related cost, which is happening inside the organization it is hidden and it, it and and it's not it's not clear to people who it, who who are these people who are being presentees and what to do about them so i think that's a really important thing to say to 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 the to, to the to the stakeholders look mental health is with us it's not the same as mental illness in fact one of the things i think is really important when you're talking to them is to make it clear that there is an important that there, there was a view, which is the pathogenic view, which is the opposite to the salutogenic view, which is that if you don't have a mental health diagnosis, you're mentally well. This is absolutely and patently not the case, right? You can, so there are people, mental illness and the lack of mental illness is, uh, is, is, is its own continuum. So there are people who have significant mental illness and there are people who have no mental illness. But vertically, in a different axis completely, there are people who are very poor mental health and have really great mental health. And you see how obviously that this kind of breaks into four quadrants. And, you know, ideally you'd like everybody to be in quadrant number two, which is functioning we're experiencing happiness and no mental illness. That'd be lovely. The way life is, and the statistics show it, is 75% of people are going to experience a, 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 an episode of mental uh, distress or disorder in their lifetime. So there's gonna be quite a number of people in quadrant one as well. But that's where you as an organization want to be aiming. You want to be aiming for optimal mental well-being for people, regardless of whether they have a diagnosis or not. That's what you're looking for. Uh, so you can have somebody who has schizophrenia, we say, who's experienced psychotic episodes. They can achieve an optimal well mental well-being at the same time as receiving uh, treatment for their symptoms, etc. And this is not going to be the subject of this. It's, I'll deal with it after Christmas. But the whole personal recovery movement and model plays a huge part in, in achieving optimal mental health for somebody who's, who has mental, uh, who has some kind of common or severe mental disorder. Um, for example, uh, and I'm not going to deal with these, and I don't think you should deal with these when you're talking to mental, to, to, to stakeholders. 
these are dealt with in uh, a number of different courses in in the in the continuing ed program and in the in the BDM. And so, if you if you need to get into this, fine. But it's not part of the topic. I just have this slide in to say to you, look. Um, sorry, there's another chat coming in here. Yeah, I'm hoping so. I'm hoping so, Kerry. I'm hoping that we will be able to share the the slides at the end of the presentation. I wouldn't. It wouldn't make sense if if that didn't happen. Um. Okay. So. Um, I just have them here, but these are the kinds of things. So when I said about 75% of people experience an episode of some kind of mental distress or disorder, most of it will be in the area of depression, anxiety, um, or chronic stress. Less, less often it will be bipolar, schizophrenia disorder, uh, schizophrenia, schizophrenia very rarely. I mean, that's a very, very small number of people. And post-traumatic stress is, is le less less often. Substance use and disorders and other addictions, very common as well. So those are the kind of mental health disorders we're talking about. Now, as I said, it's kind of silly. I'm putting it there so you can see it. You can link it to this slide and you can say, okay, you know, that, that's, over he that's over here on this side of the, of the thing. Somebody has one of these. They can still be up in quadrant one with very good mental well-being uh, and that's the trick and that's the important and very important message for uh for for uh, the stakeholders so let's get back to this okay presenteeism so i i think the best definition i've i i've seen on this is that presenteeism is a, is an act the presenteeism is an action of employees coming to work despite having a sickness that justifies an absence and as a consequence performing their work under suboptimal conditions. Nobody is expected to work 100% all of the time. I think somebody, I don't know, some Harvard review kind of worked out that we are actually, most people are about 80% productive. And that if you can, if a company can be profitable with 80% productivity and part of, on average, all their employees, that they're doing okay, that they're sustainable. Um, the, but it, presenteeism is more likely to happen in relation to mental health and other hidden uh, disorders because you're not showing anything and you just and you're rising along. And the on, on the other side of that, it, mo many companies, according to the Mood Disorder Society of Canada, do not monitor presenteeism. I, I'm just wondering, you know how do we monitor presenteeism and this comes up later on um sorry there's a long question here okay i'm going to read it out why such a drastic change in perceptions of abilities to return to work in some form or another from treating practitioners recent years uh, previously practitioners spoke highly of functioning in a meaningful way in society. Recently, there's been a switch uh, of more and more cases recommending unable to function whatsoever. That, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm really sorry, Luigi. I do not know why, uh, but, uh, but it is an interesting question that, um, that, that, that obviously I, I, I would love to kind of dig deeper into. Uh, and that may be anecdotal experience on your part. Maybe other people haven't found the same thing. But I tell you this, I agree with you, the attitudes of the treating professional can be one of the biggest barriers to a positive return to work for people with, uh, with mental health disorders. So only 15% of companies were, were, were trying to monitor presenteeism and 18% of managers were trained, which means take that the other side, right? That's a lot of people and a lot of companies not actually dealing with presenteeism at all, despite the fact that it's costing more than absence. My view is that it's not possible, you know, you can't stand at the door of your workplace or send somebody around to people's houses, you know, with, with a temperature machine to go click, oh, you're a presentee today. So you can't do that. It, it, it would be inordinately expensive to have everybody fill out a questionnaire every morning before they start work. So you really, 
the, you have to deal with presenteeism as as a global workforce issue and presenteeism and so you need to deal with it in terms of the overall capacity of all uh, health and well-being of all employees and then you have to find a way to identify um, presenteeism early. Now, I just kind of, I got two more chats here. Uh, okay, so Jenny, that's right. Okay, good. Um, they're just thanking Jenny for saying that the, the slides would be available. Um, and I, I'm going to come to it. I, I, might, I might as well say it now. The only way an organization will be able to identify workers, and this is an important message to, to management in, and HR in particular, is if, if workers tell you. So self-disclosure is a really, really important uh, uh, strategy in, in an effective integrated workplace mental health um, Okay, Adrian, I'm not sure what this means. The comment regarding EE's mental health, employees' mental health, only being taken into account within the context of performance explanation. It, it is an actual an interesting fact. That was the perception that the, the workers in the Lyra study had, was that that was all that mattered. Um, so, okay, so, uh, sorry. Right, so, um, okay, so what I was saying there was that um, really the organization has to find a way to make it safe for people to actually say, I'm not feeling very well today in terms of my mental health. And that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, the research says that basically presenteeism is associated with heavy workloads, giving people a lot of just high skill discretion. So presenteeism happens when, you know, when you are somebody either a consultant or you're in a, in a, in a position where you can basically fudge it for a while. Uh, it, it happens when basically the person feels they're very important to, to their coworkers and they don't want to put their coworkers in jeopardy and increase the workload for them, where there's a role conflict between what the person is supposed to do, and what they're trained to do, where there is psychological distress or, or where a person is experiencing psychosomatic symptoms. And that's from 2006. But more recently, uh, in terms of the Canadian Mental Health Association, other biopsychosocial factors have been identified. Caring responsibilities, being on low pay, obviously that's a motivation factor, chronic health problems, not being able to afford to go absent. That is an effect for, for, for many people. That's what they were saying. Look, it's just, that was in the, when we interviewed the 2000 people who were out of work. They couldn't afford to go out and they kept going back and going into work and, going, and then they had to go because something catastrophic, catastrophic happened in their life. Not having any else to take over their job, worrying about work piling up, worrying that you might be made redundant. And um, that, that really is, you know, that really is, is a factor. If you see somebody who isn't paying attention significantly, these are all things, these are kind of part of the discussion that you'd have with, uh, with your stakeholders. Um, if somebody has difficulty paying attention, remembering information, you have to translate that now in, into a, what is the online equivalent of not paying attention. I think probably missing out on important emails might be it. If they have difficulty thinking analytically, if they basically don't uh, respond uh, as quickly to things, uh, if they have seem to be feeling very skeptical uh, and distorted thinking, you can assume that there, there is some form of presenteeism going on. So in order to find out who, in order to intervene, you have to know who has uh, Yes, absolutely, uh, Gizzy. I think you're absolutely right. It's, 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 we, we have to create an ethos within which basically revealing um, 
sorry, basically dealing with the issue of presenteeism is not seen as a disciplinary issue. It's not seen as a productivity issue. It's seen as a well-being issue. Uh, and and so, but but in order for that to occur, you've got to change. You have to make sure the culture of the organization, because some organizations have such a culture, but you have to say that the organization culture allows for the person to feel confident to self-disclose. It's the cheapest way for early identification in terms of mental health or any other hidden disability is self-disclosure. So the key question is, how can you encourage workers to self-disclose at work and who to whom should they do so? Um, and if your workers do not feel secure in disclosing, then they're not going to do so. And therefore, basically, uh, you have your presenteeism problem. So it is economic, makes economic sense to create a situation in which people feel safe and comfortable. At, and one of the things, and I just, this is kind of a bit of a warning as well, one of the things that workers will remember is what happened to the last person who disclosed. Right, so, so there is an onus on the disability management professional to ensure that if somebody does disclose, that the outcomes for them are positive. If in the early stages of promoting this policy, there are negative con consequences for a uh, for 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 an individual worker, you could be absolutely guaranteed that will go into the myth and legend of the organization. Oh, do you remember what happened to Donald that time? Oh, no, I mean, gee, gee, gee. Well, so, it, so you have to be really well prepared when, when you're kind of building towards this uh, self-disclosure. So the reason why people said, uh, and this is a really great uh, article, and it's available in academia, uh, and it's really, it's, uh, and she basically talked to uh, uh, health, health staff, staff in the health sector. And uh, and why is it? Why would you? Why would you? Or why would you not self-disclose? So uh, one of the issues, of course, is that um, somebody might not have a diagnosis, may fear that they might have a diagnosis, may not want to go and get and check if they have a diagnosis. Uh, so basically, it mental health issues are not easily and not always identified immediately. So that kind of uncertainty, while in that uncertainty then somebody may well not want to disclose. Obviously, if you had the right environment, the person would be quite happy to basically say to a supervisor or to HR, look, I don't know, but I'm feeling pretty dodgy here. I wonder if I have a mental health problem and uh, you know, will I be able to get accommodations? The stigma and shame surrounding mental health, once again, the wording of that is wrong. The stigma and shame surrounding mental ill health issues uh, it's, it is, is a big problem that needs to be addressed. And that is not addressed. It's very clear that attitude change does not happen through one-off campaigns. It has to be something that happens. It has to be something that comes up and down the organization through transactions between opinion formers and their, um, and their subordinates. Uh, if the organization is focused on a kind of a discourse of professional competence, there is no way that somebody who is in a position of any kind of expertise or authority is going to want to disclose. There has to be a co-discourse of, of, of well-being and, uh, and, and, and support. If there are issues of social tension within a team, you're not going to let your competitors know that you're feeling. If you're, if workload pressures are there, and you're and you're worried about creating the workload pressure for other people, you don't disclose for the sake for their sake. You don't want to reveal, uh, and the fact that it doesn't in, in some cases it didn't make any difference whether I did disclose or not because there was no supports for me anyway. So you really have to have the environment sorted out if you want uh, that uh, if you want the uh, the disclosure process to happen. Uh, and these were the things that worked: individual 
colleagues and managers who were empathetic and intuitive. You can see this is building to some kind of training for um, for managers and leaders and, and probably union uh, reps as well, because they, they can be great advocates. The culture of teams need to be clearly focused on mutual support. So, you, you know, you must be kind of closing your eyes and saying, oh, my God, this is almost impossible. You know, how can we change everything that's going on in the organization from where it's at to where we need to get to? But all I'm saying is this is what the data is showing is that if you train managers, supervisors to respond effectively to mental health in a challenges in a supportive manner, people will be more likely to break their silence. If you can get, I mean, I'm looking at, at, at this, there's 137 people at this seminar. I am absolutely sure that there is at least uh, a very high, well, I won't say at least, but there's a, there, there is a proportion of us who are at this meeting, who could break the silence, who could say, actually, I was under a huge amount of stress, or I was really distressed, or I experienced anxiety. If you can get opinion formers and leaders to and, and managers to break the silence first, it really, it's like a log jam. It just basically breaks up the log jam and things start to change very rapidly. And it turns out that Dimoff and Killaway basically show that a relatively short training session for leaders actually makes a difference to the extent to which workers were willing to access mental health resources. So it could make a difference. Okay, another chat here. No, that's just thank you, Jenny. Okay, um, so I, I'm just, I think I'm gonna, I've only got 10 minutes left. So I'm just going to go through the ICT thing because it kind of fits in with the COVID thing. And so it gives you a nice kind of bookend to the thing. Um, so uh, the US, US Center for Disease Control basically published a guidance on how do you support mental health using ICT? Well, the first thing is you have to use more than one channel. You have to use multiple channels of communication. So you do need Teams, but you also need email. You also need, you, you know, not everything gets funneled into one platform. Email, webinars, training videos. Use regular one-to-one -one conversations with people. So like having an open door policy, you know, having people and talking to people in one-to-one. -one. Be flexible in terms of scheduling and make sure that people have time to rest, exercise, or volunteer. Uh, Use your uh, social media to talk to uh, your workers in relation to their well-being and their health. Engage in activities using apps, like it, give everybody a Fitbit. Well, I mean, you, you obviously that would be too much to do, but uh, there are organizations that do that. They And everybody is basically on the same online tracking system and they're all comparing and they're looking at benchmarks. Uh, set various goals uh, to motivate people to, to participate. Uh, have meetings with people using mobile technology where they have to walk. You know, so they have to be on a treadmill or they have to be walking around their house or they have to be riding on a bike. Uh, use the, you know, use your various media, uh, media platforms to produce healthy living stories from other remote workers from ask invite people to say good things and allow that to be passed around the organization uh reimburse fitness memberships uh and um and have some kind of amazing socially distant masked event where people can actually come together outdoors and raise funds for charity. So I thought it was interesting. This is the US Center for Disease Control. <laughs> you know, they, normally they're talking about take this drug or that drug or, you know, well, and I think that's a really nice set of things to do. It is also important, you know, to use ICT to support um, uh, mental health of people in on-site places as well. The problem is, and this is one of the things that, one of the reasons why we, we did the program, Paul uh, 
project. That there are there are actually nine hundred mobile apps were identified in two thousand sixteen in a systematic review, and most of them had no evidence that they actually worked. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I don't know what I, I didn't look at them. I don't know if they involved angels or whatever, but. Uh, only 16 had evidence. Now, it doesn't mean some of the others weren't very good, but only 16 had evidence-based content, transparency, and functionality. And I just want to kind of point you towards one, which I am very impressed with. This is the Copenhagen uh, Stress Questionnaire, COPSOC, and uh, it was basically turned into an app by the Canadian Center for Occupational Health and Safety and the Occupational Health Clinics of, for Ontario Workers, OCAP. And it's called Stress Assess. Now, some of you may know this really well, uh, but I, I got on. I was hoping to be able to demonstrate it on my machine for you, but it is absolutely an excellent tool. I had a student last year who did a, a, a work on it with some health, uh, health workers. It got very highly um, rated by the workers themselves. It is something that you might be able to use to begin to gather data from people that would basically support your view to the, um, you know, to the stakeholders that, hey, yeah, we need to do something about this. So I, I realize that time is running out now. So I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to stop. Uh, there's, there's six minutes left. Uh, so if there's anybody has any other chat questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. If not, I, I, and as I say, you will be able to see the rest of this presentation includes more details on an integrated uh, mental health program and some questions that you would ask about uh, psychological health and safety and some questions to ask about stress. Are there any, any other comments? I'm going to stop my share now. Thank you, Raj. Okay, thank you, Louise. Yes, it's 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 really yeah. And, and I oh yes, sorry. There is one extra slide that I will show you uh, before the thing ends, and that is this one. Okay, there's my email address. I would be very happy to uh, to follow up with anyone. Uh, and uh, and if, if uh, particularly supposing you want one of those articles I mentioned and you look at them and you think, hey, I would really like that. If you can't get it yourself, uh, it would be really great to, uh, you know, you just call me or just email me and I'll, uh, I'll send you and send you the link. Okay. Okay, so um, I tell you what, I, given that there are no particular questions, there's some very nice comments, and thank you all very much. I very much appreciate that. Uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the um, stress factors that, that that contribute to negative and toxic stress is an effort reward imbalance. Can I say? to all of you who have said such nice things to me, uh, that my effort reward is in balance. Uh, you've really balanced it out for me. Um, okay, is this a long one? Oh, um, so I'm gonna read it out. I know we don't have time to touch on this. However, we can really have this conversation without touching on the impact of the mental health in the workplace, seeing discrimination uh, on a large scale in terms of vaccine requirements and the pressure regardless of the person's decision of how this is impacting the mental health workers. I, I agree absolutely, Liz, yes. Um, uh, well, I'll tell you, uh, yes, I can send, okay, fair enough. Uh, so what Megan is suggesting is that I send to 
uh, to Jenny a bibliography. I just send a reference bibliography with, with the links and everybody will have that as well. 